Hello everyone! Now we'll pick up where we just left off, with a game that is really important. It uh, has a lot of influence. You can feel its DNA in games today. Super Metroid. So Super Metroid is very similar to Zelda because it's a series that had a similar trajectory starting out. The first game in both series is an ambitious, open but flawed game. The second game misses the mark in the third entry on the Super Nintendo sort of perfects things while making it maybe a little more streamlined. Super Metroid has a tone and mood which is just a bit different than what you'd expect from Nintendo. Throughout the game, you make bounty hunter Samus Aran more powerful with different upgrades to her suit. It has this real interesting curve to the game where you start off very weak, abandoned on this planet, and then you gradually become stronger and stronger and more capable. It's the entire draw to the Metroid series. You get new powers so you can explore new areas to find new powers to explore new areas. It's kind of a cycle. And what makes the game work is its world. The way the world flows from one area to another feels very natural, even though the world is very alien. It manages to make a world that's very interesting to explore, and that kind of just feels kind of freeing in a way. It's not finish a level, then you go to the next level, which is completely different than the one you just went to. You're going from one area that has a, a certain type of biome to it to another area that you used your skills to get to. Super Metroid uses space and the player's navigation through space to make a convincing place to interact with, to explore. Just to get a picture of how important Super Metroid is to the development of video games, just pick up any indie game that's a side-scroller and good chance that it's going to be a Metroid-inspired game, like Guacamelee, Ori in the Blind Forest, Cave Story. Basically, Super Metroid, we love it to bits, we want to kiss it on the lips. So the original Punch-Out! is maybe the best game on the NES. It's probably the one that has aged the best, thanks to its large and detailed sprites, and gameplay that's simple, but takes a lot to master. Now, Super Punch-Out! is no different. In Super Punch-Out!, you fight a rogues gallery of not quite as offensive racist stereotypes, including an untrustworthy Irishman, a Bruce Lee, a cheating Mexican luchador heel, and a Canadian lumberjack. Instead of the star meter from the original Super Punch-Out!, which you were rewarded stars for hitting the opponent at opportune times, this game has a power meter that you fill up for getting clean hits. Once the meter is filled up, you can unleash special rapid punches or uppercuts at any time you want until you get hit, in which case the meter lowers. It has a different mechanic, and I really appreciate that it uses Mode 7 to kind of give the, give the fight some like dynamic movement. You aren't quite as static, like even though you're not moving your character around, you're just kind of dodging left and right, ducking and stuff like that. The fight still has this kind of movement to it that wasn't really possible on the NES. The different power-up mechanic is really nice because it allows for a different flow to the fight where, you know, you're you're trying to trying to work it to get powerful and then you have you're in this powerful state and you're just in it until until you get hit. And you could just unleash all sorts of mayhem on the bosses, but you need to still watch out. You maybe some of those punches are a bit slower to pull off, so you need to kind of time it a bit better. He's a lot more wind up for some of those power punches. The game is kind of also a puzzle game. You're reading enemy tells while trying to knock them out as quickly as you can. Final Fantasy VI, or three as it was known once in the United States, is one of the greatest JRPGs ever made. It has fantastic music and visuals for its time. The party members all have their unique abilities and stories, which you discover throughout the game. Some of which are kind of secret, and I won't really spoil them, but you might find some little nuggets about some characters in some unexpected places, and it's just just a fascinating game to discover its world and characters. And unlike previous Final Fantasies, it's not focusing mainly on one person. You know, initially it is, but it kind of branches off and becomes a story about the whole group. Arguably, the game has maybe like six or so main characters. It, it feels like it gives all of them enough time. In your main party, I think there's like up to a dozen main characters that you can have. You know, some are less important than others, but the main ones are all well-developed, likable. They all have their own reasons for fighting against the Empire. And they all have their own abilities, like I mentioned. 
So one of them, um, Sabin, is a monk, and all his moves that you can perform with his special option are all just fighting game commands. So you're doing, you know, quarter circle forwards for his big energy blast Kamehameha move. You have a ninja that can throw things, and he has this little dog that will sometimes block attacks or get an attack in. Um, there's Edward, who has different mechanical things that he can use, like an auto crossbow or a chainsaw. There's a feral boy that can learn abilities from enemies and then use those abilities in a fight. There's a samurai that has a very slow meter that fills up, which isn't a great ability, but hey, they were trying to do something different. Also, the game has a interesting character progression system with Magicite and the Relics, which allow you to create some really cool party builds where you slap some Magicite onto someone, every time they level up they get an additional bit of health. So you can, throughout the game, kind of steer the character's stats in a certain way. The game also goes to some really unexpected places, which again, I don't want to spoil because this game is still really good, really kind of heartfelt story at times, despite its really silly JRPG-ness. <laughs> also the ATB system is back, where a timer fills up and then that's how your party takes turns. I would definitely recommend Final Fantasy VI. It's a great RPG, a really interesting world and story, and you should definitely check it out. Donkey Kong Country is Donkey Kong's return. So he hadn't really had a game that I can think of for a while, maybe Donkey Kong Jr. He was in Mario Kart, but this is his like starring role where you play as Donkey Kong. And he was really showing off those 3D models, those pre-rendered 3D models. So it has this like weird look it's a little blurry nowadays because it's such an old 3D model, but it, I think it still looks good. In Donkey Kong Country, you can switch between Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong. They sort of act as your like hits, like in Mario, where he's like big Mario and then turns little Mario. If you're Donkey Kong and you have Diddy and you get hit as Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong dies and Diddy pops out and you play as him. Um, or you can switch between them. And they have slightly different properties. Donkey Kong holds a barrel above him. Diddy Kong holds it in front of him. Donkey Kong is slower, but can kill certain enemies Diddy can't, while Diddy kind of has more speed and I think a better, slightly better jump. He just has a little bit more fluid of motion. Like Mario World, Donkey Kong Country has interesting kind of like gimmick stages, like the water levels, the minecart stages, and then you also get um, different animal buddies to ride, like Rambi the Rhino, Express of the Ostrich, you have Unguard the Swordfish, which makes the water levels a lot better. Also, like Mario World, you have a two-player mode, but you have the option of a competitive mode where one person is a team of Donkey Kong and Diddy, and then the other person is a team of Donkey Kong and Diddy, and they just try to see who can get farther. Or a co-op mode where one person's Donkey Kong and the other's Diddy, and then when one dies, the other takes over. You know, they're not running around at the same time, which is kind of a shame, but eh, that probably would have en ended up being way too chaotic because you need to jump off certain enemies to progress in the level, and it just wouldn't work out if you had two people running around. Like, the levels obviously weren't designed for two people running around, and it just wouldn't work. Kirby's Dream Course is the one game I look at on this Super Nintendo Classic lineup, and I just kind of ask why. It's a good game. It's not bad. It's a fun little mini golf game with like Kirby skin on it. You can compete with another player and play some mini golf with some wacky traps in your way. But it's just, just I, I just look at it and wonder like this is really one of the 21 best Super Nintendo games that they had. Like I could think of probably a dozen other Super Nintendo games that are classics over this one. But I, I guess. I guess it's kind of there to serve as a sports game. We didn't really get a whole lot of sports games other than Super Nintendo Classic, and this is really the closest thing they can do because we don't have Tecmo Super Bowl or Super High Impact, sadly. So, yeah, I guess this is the best they can do. And, you know, it's still fun. It's still a golf game. You know, maybe this game would also benefit from actually being 3D instead of a, a 2D game because you could judge depth a little better and and have different camera angles and all that but you know it's still it's still a fun game just i just look at it and ask why 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 is this on here so earthbound i'm just gonna say earthbound is my favorite game ever made its writing holds up well its world is quirky and strange but in a very cute way 
and it was my first RPG. Oddly enough, like I said, it's an interesting world and story with a really flat set of main characters, so basically it's a parody of Dragon Quest. The RPG mechanics are pretty simple, but it does some interesting things like the rolling HP meter, where damage ticks away when the player is hit, allowing you to maybe pull some clutch game-saving moves like killing the enemy before you die, or healing up before you die, just something that you know saves you from eventual death. Also, the characters are kind of diverse. You have you know, your main character, Ness, that you can name different names, and he's just all around really good. He has some good attack stuff. He has a lot of support stuff, oddly enough, for a main character. He has a lot of healing, and he's also, like, the strongest physically. Like, his attack is just amazing, and he has amazing health. He's just a really good character. Paula, who's kind of like a weak magic caster, she has the best offensive magic in the game, but... Other than that, she's kind of like a glass cannon. Jeff, who's interesting because he's the one party member that doesn't have psychic powers, but he does make different machines that you can use, which end up being really beneficial, like some of the the bottle rockets that he can get, or some of the, the stuff that he can invent in his sleep, um, which ends up being very useful if you know what to to fix up. And then also you have Pooh, who doesn't like Western food because he's a monk and doesn't get much benefit from it. Also, by the way, this game has healing items like hamburgers and pizza and bottles of water, which bottles of water heal poo more than pizza because I guess it upsets his monk tummy. Um, it's basically an RPG 80s kids movie like Goonies, but through a Japanese lens. So you're fighting aliens and different weird monsters, zombies. It's just like a just a interesting take on an RPG and something you don't really see too often. And also that ripoff music is fantastic. Yoshi's Island Super Mario World 2 is Yoshi's big platformer debut. Yoshi must homeward bound baby Mario to baby Luigi and then deliver the babies to Mario's parents. Yoshi's Island has this childlike crayon drawing art style to it. Much like Mario World, every level seems to have its own identity with some really fun gimmick levels like Touch Fuzzy Get Dizzy and then the one where you're being chased by horrific chain chomps. Also with this game, Mario's boss fights are starting to get a lot more creative. It sort of reminds me of some boss fights from later Zelda games or the Mario Galaxy games. And it has maybe one of the best boss fights in any Mario game. Like the Mar the ending boss fight at the end of this is just so cool. Also, Yoshi's Island is a collectathon. You have the option of finding all of the flowers, red coins, and stars in each level, and then you're graded at the end for finding. And it's you know a fun thing if you feel like replaying levels to fully get what you can out of Yoshi's Island and it's just a real great game with a really unique throwing mechanic and Yoshi's weird tonguing. Nom. Super Mario RPG The Legend of the Seven Stars is the beginning of Mario's foray into the RPG genre. Super Mario RPG is a fantastic collaboration between Nintendo and Square. Two of the party members, Mallow and Gino, I feel like personally need to be in a whole lot more Mario games because they're just way too likable to be contained in just this game and their designs were rad, yet still true to Mario's style. Super Mario RPG introduces a action command battle system. It's so simplistic, but it gives Mario just a tiny bit of skill that makes his combat just, just that much more interesting. You need to press the buttons at the right time to boost your damage. Special moves also have different commands, like Mario's jump special needs you to time the jump and you can repeatedly do jump damage. Some special moves require you to mash around on the d-pad or, or smash on a button. Also keeping up with Mario tradition, Mario still jumps around the overworld so they still incorporate kind of some platforming despite it being a mostly traditional RPG. I mean, I guess that's kind of what makes Super Mario RPG charming is in the ways that it's not a traditional Mario game or a traditional RPG but somehow blends the two things where you might actually care about some of the Mario characters in this game and their stories. Also Bowser and Toadstool in this game. Bowser's really funny and well written um, and you visit a lot of interesting areas with some new enemies and uh, it's, just a, it's just a blast of an RPG. You should definitely check it out if you like the genre or just Mario in general. If you don't like RPGs, it might get you into some RPGs because it did, it did for me back in the day.
Okay. Kirby Superstar was a late release for the Super Nintendo, but don't sleep on Kirby Superstar. It's probably the best Kirby game. Kirby Superstar features on-the-fly co-op. Kirby can basically just poop out a partner whenever you want, and the second player can just start playing as them. And they also share food by kissing to restore their health, which is kind of gross, but somehow manages to be cute because it's Kirby. And I guess he just, like, injects food into, like, Waddle Doo's eye. Also, Kirby Superstar features several different adventures, ranging from a remake of Kirby's Dreamland. There's a big cave adventure, a space quest, an assault on Meta Knight's Dreadnought, and a block breaking challenge, among a couple other modes. In this game, Kirby's abilities have a move list, and this gives Superstar a lot more depth and variety than mostly every other Kirby game. Let's say you hold the attack button as fighter, he does a different move than if you were to tap the attack button. Or if you hold the attack button as the beam ability, you have a charge move. If you tap it, he just has this like little stream move. Or if you're running and you attack, it's going to be a different move than if you were standing still. If you're in the air, it's going to be a different move than if you were on the ground. Replay this level, maybe you'll try doing it as the plasma ability. Maybe you'll try it as the wheel. Maybe you'll try it, you know, with the flame. There's just a lot of different things you can do with this game, and with the adventure mode, there's treasures to find, the Milky Way Wishes space quest campaign, there's a whole lot of different secrets to find, abilities to unlock. It just does, like, a lot of stuff. With the very basic Kirby formula, it just, like, pumps it full of just great gameplay somehow. Like, despite Kirby being so simple, this game allows Kirby to be interesting. Like, I feel like he's never been since or before. Generally, Kirby games, you have the cutter ability. He throws out a boomerang, that's it. Fire ability, he shoots fire out of his mouth. Maybe they'll be like, oh, combine Kirby with a cat or a bird. Kirby Superstar introduces new ideas and ways to control Kirby that are so organic that they don't come off as gimmicks like Kirby's animal buddies. Or that time he turned into yarn. So the final game, the final game on the Super Nintendo Classic is Star Fox 2, which was released this year because it never actually came out before. It's the canned Star Fox sequel, which was leaked online as a prototype years ago, and it was cancelled presumably because the PS1, Sega Saturn, and Nintendo 64 were out, and compared to those consoles, the Super Nintendo just didn't live up. Star Fox 2 actually has a really ambitious structure to it. You are given a map of the solar system, Missiles are being launched at Corneria, and you need to protect it while also taking out enemy bases. So there's this strategy layer to it, but then also some of the classic Star Fox gameplay, but with some like open range, all range mode levels, where you're flying over a surface, trying to shoot some dishes, or trying to trigger some switches or something to get into a base, and taking out the core of the base, and then flying away. It just has like a a lot going on, you know, Star Wolf's here, and Star Wolf sort of serves as a rival to the Star Fox team. There's a lot of good dog fights with Star Wolf. Several different playable characters like Fox, Falco, Peppy, Slippy, and then these two, this Poodle and this Lynx, um, which kind of has cool designs. I wish they would show up in a different Star Fox game. Also, there's three different models of ships with their own stats and specials. Like the first game, it's designed for several runs, but I feel like its strategic map structure allows it to be different because maybe this time you'll fly over here and then Andross will release this space dragon for you to fight. Or this run, your Fox ship got exploded, so Fox is out of commission, you need to bring in Peppy to fight. Also, the game has this cool walking tank. You can go inside of these these structures and take out bases. This like weird relic from a system which was trying to do this almost like mock 3D. Like it's 3D but it's like such primitive 3D on the Super Nintendo into real 3D like the N64 or the the PS1. It's just a really interesting like even if you don't enjoy the game it's just a really interesting bit of history. A bit of Nintendo's history and, and gaming history. So to wrap things up, the Super Nintendo, it just has a fantastic lineup. However, there's some notable games which are missing from the console. Most obviously, Chrono Trigger, since it is consistently on top of people's lists for the best Super Nintendo games. 
and you know Square is already on board for the Super Nintendo Classic, so why isn't Chrono Trigger on here? Um, also, Final Fantasy IV would have been another good RPG choice. Maybe one of the Quintet trilogy of games. Maybe a sports game like NBA Jam. Now in Japan, their Super Famicom Classic had Legend of the Mystical Ninja, Super Soccer, Fire Emblem, Mystery of the Emblem, Super Street Fighter II, The New Challengers, and Panel de Pawn. But the Super Famicom Classic didn't receive the games we got like Super Castlevania IV, Street Fighter II Turbo, Hyper Fighting, Super Punch-Out, Earthbound, and Kirby's Dream Course. Looking at the list of games that we didn't get, I feel like this era of games is just so gameplay focused, it would have been nice to have some of these games cross over, even if not fully translated. I'm a big fan of like Final Fantasy V, so a version of that while extremely wishful thinking would have been amazing. But there's no reason we couldn't have had Mystical Ninja, Super Soccer, Super Street Fighter 2, or Tetris Attack, the US version of Panel de Pawn over here, because those games all had English releases. I don't think space is really an issue because these games are like such small files. I don't know the reasoning why we wouldn't have those four games. Now, Fire Emblem, Mystery of the Emblem is a different story because it is a story-focused game. It has not been translated officially into English, so it's kind of a different story. But even then, it would have been nice to have those games, even if it is, like I said, wishful thinking. There's just so many games back in the day that we didn't get on the Super Nintendo, like Star Fox 2. It would have been nice to have like an official version of like Senken and Sensu 3. Or, you know, just some of those great games that you hear about that people that people know about that just have never been officially released here. It's just a real real shame that we didn't have any of those. So I recommend if you're able to find one, get an, a Super Nintendo Classic. It's a great value. It's hundreds of hours worth of gameplay here. It's such a great mix of jump-in arcade-type games with simple controls, but great challenge, as well as those games that are just big adventures which span days. It's a fantastic package, and despite some of the nitpicks I've had, it's a great way to play some of the best games ever made. Thank you all for tuning into this video. I hope you all have a great day, and bye bye